Jordan's videos often begin with some quote, um, a wise saying by some great individual, and, you know, I think I'm actually gonna do the same thing here. Spirit Science Lesson 12 is a one-hour monstrosity that I doubt is even possible to debunk in full. Allow me to demonstrate why. Here's Jordan taking the 30-second stupid count challenge. Modern views of our history account for many things, but completely dismiss many very important pieces in the puzzle. For example, the Pyramids of Giza. There is no modern theory that accounts for how these could have been made. Individually, each block cannot be pulled even with 50 men pulling it, let alone drag it for hundreds of miles and then stack them on top of each other 450 feet in the air, in such a precise way that even modern technology can't achieve. Not to mention having it lined up precisely with both Orion's belt, a golden mean, and Fibonacci spiral, and be a primary nodal point of every sacred site on the planet. And that's just one example. Our history is not what we think. Many things that we've been led to believe to be true simply is not. And that's not even the stupid part. Now, this is why I decided to take on the Atlantis thing last time, just to sort of demonstrate that one of the central parts of his story is complete horseshit, and it's just a it's not even an old story, it's a butchering of an old story made by New Age pseudo-historians who want to cash in on the fact that people are at least somewhat familiar with that old story. I don't see much point wasting hours upon hours addressing every stupid thing Jordan says. I'll hit a few of them, but mostly I'm just gonna facepalm and make bad jokes, and frankly that's all it deserves. On occasion I will provide links that will also be found in the description for people who want to read more. Now these links are not supposed to be regarded as authoritative sources, they are simply starting points for people who want to learn more or explore the same thing Jordan talks about except from a skeptical perspective. There was a time, long ago, when humans existed at a very high level of consciousness. We lived primarily on a large string of islands called Lemuria. Lemuria was a hypothetical sunken land bridge between India and Madagascar. It was an attempt by 19th century scientists to explain why the fossil record is similar in those places, but no other places. Like Atlantis, Lemuria has been hijacked by New Age pseudo-scientists and pseudo-historians. No scientist ever suggested that humans lived there. This would have been millions of years ago, before there were humans. Plus, the hypothesis was rendered obsolete by the discovery of plate tectonics. But there was a consciousness shift. We moved up in consciousness, and the islands of Lumeria sank beneath the oceans. Yeah, well, obviously, when there's a shift in consciousness, a continent has to sink. Duh. At the time of this shift, a new continent rose out of the waters. Don't say Atlantis, don't say Atlantis, don't say Atlantis. We called it Atlantis. I dealt with it last time, keep going. At that time, there were about 1,000 humans at a very high consciousness, more than all of the rest. They were called the Nikals. They projected their energies across the surface of the continent in the form of the Tree of Life. Suddenly, in a single day, the Nikals breathed life into the Tree of Life on the surface of Atlantis. This created vortexes of energy rotating out of each and every circle. Once the vortexes were established, the children of Lemuria began to be called forth. I know, I know. Um, they were called there by the psychic whatchamacallit, and then Manx left Kerrigan there to die, right? What? Though the Lemurians had only filled eight of the vortex areas, Mayan records state clearly that there were ten cities in Atlantis when it fell. No. You can see these records in the Troano document, which is now located in the British Museum. This is a well-known hoax perpetrated by Paul Schliemann in 1912, published in a newspaper article. The Troano document doesn't mention Atlantis, and it's not in London, it's in Madrid. To fill these two empty vortexes, according to Thoth, two extraterrestrial races stepped in. Because apparently this wasn't stupid enough yet. The first race were the Hebrews. <laughs> Jews are from Spain. Well, you know, now that you mention it, 
I've always thought Hebrew sounded like Klingon. The other race that stepped in caused big problems. These beings came from the nearby planet of Mars. Martians. Okay. I suppose I could point out that there's never been any advanced life on Mars, that at best there may have been very primitive organisms there about four billion years ago before the planet cooled off and lost its magnetic field and then its atmosphere, or at least most of it. But let's not get boring old reality involved here, shall we? According to Thoth, Mars looked very much like Earth a little less than a million years ago, but something happened to them, and it has to do with something called the Lucifer Experiment. When the Martians severed the love bond, they became pure male, logical beings with no emotions. What happened on Mars was that they ended up fighting. If they didn't have any emotions, then why did they get so pissed at each other? They blew their atmosphere away and destroyed the surface of the planet. The Merkaba was known in ancient times as the Chariot of Ascension. It is the star tetrahedral energy field around the body. The Merkaba, which is both a tool and part of your being, can be used to do the impossible, included but not limited to changing dimensions and traveling through the universe. Before Mars was destroyed, they built huge tetrahedral pyramid, eventually building a complex that was able to build a synthetic Merkaba. A small group of Martians tried to get away from Mars before it was destroyed, and that place they found was Earth about 65,000 years in our past. The first thing they did when they arrived in Atlantis was try to take over the continent. So not the whole world then. Come on, you've got to give me something to work with, Jordan. Before we continue, we have to talk about polar shifts. Scientists believe that if there was going to be a physical pole shift, there would also be a change in the magnetic poles. Yes, if you flip a magnet upside down, the magnetic field will also flip upside down. But that's not what a pole shift means. It typically refers to geomagnetic reversal, and that's a completely different thing. No one is suggesting that the Earth flips upside down, just the magnetic field does. The last shift that took place was 13,000 years ago, and we will get there in the story soon. There's no indication of a pole shift 13,000 years ago. There was... A study published not too long ago that mentioned a uh, shift that happened briefly about 41,000 years ago. I'm linking to an article about that. But aside from that, the latest pole shift was 780,000 years ago. Either way, nothing happened 13,000 years ago. In a single day, the magnetics would do a complete flip, or turn 90 degrees. There's that number again. And within 24 hours, the sun would be rising differently than it did the previous day. A magnetic reversal typically takes thousands of years and it has no effect on where the sun rises because it's not the Earth that flips. Again, it's just a magnetic field. At the surface of the Earth, the crust, could slip over the main mass of the Earth, which continues its rotation as if nothing happened. The crust of the Earth does slide over the mantle, but we're talking about millionths of a degree per year. This is because the mass of the crust isn't evenly distributed, so it's affected by things like centrifugal force and the moon's gravity. There's no known mechanism that could cause it to turn 90 or 180 degrees in one day. And if it did, the crust would crack all over the place because of all the stress involved, and that would lead to volcanic eruptions happening all over the planet, which would lead to a mass extinction event. You know, crap coming up in the atmosphere, blocking out the sunlight. Uh, it would pretty much be the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah. Except for Jordan making this video. There's one other thing that we need to discuss about polar shifts. They always line up with a consciousness shift. Well, obviously. Things kind of settled for a while, and then between 13,000 and 16,000 years ago, a comet approached the Earth. Because we were living at a high consciousness across all dimensions, the Atlanteans became aware of it before it hit. The Martians, who were in the minority, even though they were in control, wanted to blow it out of the sky with their laser technology. No, 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 no. Laser. However, the Nikals had learned of the comet's true nature, and the Atlanteans protested. They said that the comet was in divine order. They had to allow it to take place naturally. They were kind of stupid. The Martians fought the Atlanteans, but in the end, they gave in. The Martians agreed to let it hit the Earth. They were kind of stupid. 
When the time arrived, it came screaming into the atmosphere, plunging into the Atlantic Ocean, just off to the western shores of Atlantis, near where Charleston, South Carolina is now. Only that was at the bottom of the ocean at the time. Hang on. Jews were from space, and now apparently, as a consequence of what you just said, it seems like you're saying that Native Americans came from the bottom of the sea. I'm sensing a disturbing theme here. Let me guess. The Atlanteans were all white, right? Although the main portion struck near Charleston, a few fragments actually hit the main body of Atlantis, crashing into an area right where the Martians were living, killing a huge portion of their population. They were pissed. Their primary interface with the reality was control, and when their anger rose to meet their desire for control, they decided to take over the Earth. Of course! They began to once again create a complex like the one they built on Mars long ago to try and create another synthetic Merkaba. The Martians built the buildings in Atlantis. They set up the whole experiment, threw the switch, and lost control. They were kind of stupid. The experiment began to rip open the dimensional levels. Not the higher ones, but the lower ones. A huge number of lower dimensional spirits and beings were thrown out of their comfort zone and into these higher levels. To survive, they needed bodies and began automatically entering into the bodies of people. Body things. Well, we had to get to Scientology at some point, didn't we? The Martians' attempt at controlling the world took place on one of the small islands in the west of Atlantis. This place today is known as the Bermuda Triangle. Is there no end to the stupid? The Nicals did their best to save Atlantis. They sent most of the lower dimensional beings back, at least as many as they could, and sealed up the dimensional tear. Despite this, the situation got really bad, really fast. The Nicals had no idea what to do. They were kind of stupid. They were children compared to the events that had been thrust upon them, so they prayed. They were kind of stupid. The problem was reviewed on many high levels of life. Who I am drawing is the Justice League because the 11th and 12th dimensions are completely incomprehensible to us in our current state. What they told us was this, we were going to fall. I've always said prayer doesn't work. We were going to hit rock bottom. Well, that's okay as long as it's not followed up by the people's elbow. Level 1. No biggie, it takes about 5 minutes to grind your way to level 2. And finally, and this was the shocker, we would only have 13,000 years to return to Christ consciousness. Meaning what? And why? Thoth, who was the priest king of Atlantis at the time, learned that they would have to perform this experiment on themselves. They received instructions from the highest levels of life and they went on their way. Thoth proceeded with a being named Ra and Aragat, who were previous kings of Atlantis, and began the experiment. To understand what they did, we have to talk about consciousness grids. Oh, this sounds like fun. A planetary grid is an etheric crystalline structure that- Stop. Hang on. Let's assume for a moment that the ether exists, which it doesn't. How can something be made of an immaterial substance and still be crystalline? That envelops the planet and holds the consciousness of any one species of life. This grid does have an electromagnetic component associated with the third dimension. So it should be measurable then. These grids give off light as well, and from space they can be seen as the source of the bluish glow around the Earth. Oh, no, that's caused by sunlight interacting with the atmosphere. It's called Riley scattering. What Thoth and friends had to do was create a synthetic Christ consciousness grid, allowing humans to ascend to the Christ consciousness in a very short time. The first thing they did was to fly to a place which is now called the Giza Plateau. Oh, here we go. These men were six dimensional beings at that time and were living at a very high level of consciousness. So whatever they thought happened instantly. Okay, now you've done it. Now you've ruined the whole story. You're saying that these people could solve any problem with a single thought. That annoying time limit you mentioned? Solved. Make the Martians go away? Solved. Why didn't they think about that to begin with? I guess they're stupid. Oh, wait, that's another problem they could have solved. I want to be smart. Done. When your protagonists are omnipotent, you have no story, you have no plot, because it's been consumed by the plot holes. According to Thoth... No, according to Melchizedek, claiming to be channeling Thoth. He built the Great Pyramid, not the Egyptian king Cheops. Thoth says that it was built 200 years prior to the pole shift and built very quickly. So, 9,000 years before they were actually built. Now, I guess they weren't tombs, either. I guess all those 
texts and drawings the Egyptians left behind can be dismissed just like that because, hey, Melchizedek says his invisible friend told him so. The creation of all of the sacred sites on the planet were no accident. It was a single consciousness that created them all. Which is why they're sacred to different religions and incorporate traits specific to different cultures. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Not only has Thoth told us this in person, but he's also written it down in the Emerald Tablets. I'll skip this part I addressed it last time. However, this leaves us with a 24 square foot piece of the Great Pyramid that's missing. If what Thoth says is true, that missing piece actually belongs to a very special airship that exists on Earth. Airship. And the way to the airship is through the Sphinx. Huh? The Sphinx, according to Thoth, is not 12,000 years old, but dates back over five and a half million years on Earth. Deep under the Sphinx, about one mile down, is a round room with a flat floor and flat ceiling. Inside this room is the oldest synthetic object on Earth. The object is about two city blocks in size. It's round like a disc and has a flat bottom and top. It is also only about three atoms thick, except for a pattern on the top and bottom which looks like this. This pattern is five atoms thick. Thoth says that it's powered by consciousness, thoughts, and feelings, and connects with your own living Merkaba, which means that it becomes an extension of you and your own energy fields. The ship is also intimately connected with the spirit of the Earth, and is the protector for the whole planet. And it did a great job fighting off the Martians, didn't it? Wait a minute. How does an airship fly in space? The poles began to shift, and human consciousness began to plummet. Simultaneously, the electromagnetic and magnetic fields of the Earth collapsed, and all life on the planet went into the Great Void, the three and a half days of absolute blackness described by many ancient cultures in the world. Earlier you said it was one day, but we've been over this. There was no pole shift 13,000 years ago. This resulted in us losing our memories. I wish I'd lose my memory right about now. When we existed on Atlantis, we were living at a very high level of consciousness, in a higher dimension. We had extremely advanced and sophisticated bodies and minds, and were capable of practically anything, living in a dimension where molecules were spaced so far apart that consciousness could interact with them without physically moving. So when we lived in Atlantis, which was a continent on Earth, we actually lived in a different universe where the laws of nature are completely different. Jordan, are you even trying to make sense? This is why today we are so physically advanced compared to pretty much all the other animals in this third dimension. No, we're not. Our bodies are absolutely pathetic. The only thing advanced about us is our intelligence. Though after watching your videos and interacting with your fanboys, it's clear to me that I'm going to have to reevaluate that. The reason we're having such a hard time finding evidence of Atlantis is because for the most part, the events of Atlantis took place on a much higher dimension than our physical Earth exists on right now. The time to believe something is when there is evidence to support it, not when the guy making the claim comes up with some lame, reality-defying excuse for why there won't be any evidence. If the warship hadn't been protected by the Merkaba, the Nikals would have lost their memories. Meaning that those who listen to Melchizedek have access to unverifiable special knowledge. You'll, you'll just have to trust this guy, right? That's, that, that's the only way to know. Yeah, you know what the problem with that is? That means it's indistinguishable from something Melchizedek pulled out of his ass. Now, we're going to begin bridging the gaps between this story and our current history. Good luck! This is where we fell in consciousness, point C. And this was our falling asleep phase, too. Thoth, Ra, and the Ascended Masters were waiting until point D. They had to wait for humans to just evolve themselves over a 6,500 year time period until they were advanced enough to actually receive this new information that they were going to provide. Sometime in here was when the flood of Noah occurred. The primary physically visible difference between these DNA in all life is height. The first level has an average height of four to six feet tall. The second level, us, has an average height of five to seven feet. Third are about 10 to 16 feet, which we are about to translate to. Fourth is 30 to 35 feet, and the last is 50 to 60. This is a place in Egypt today called Abu Simbel. The first thing you notice is that these statues are huge, but with the information about the DNA, this paints a different picture. These beings would be in the 60-foot range if they were to stand. They were at the fifth level of consciousness. No, the people weren't that tall. You're talking about statues, you moron. Thoth's son Tat formed a group called the Tat Brotherhood, which is a secret group that still exists today as protectors and keepers of the sacred temples. It's not very secret. You just told the whole world about it, you idiot. For over 40 years, Drunvalo Melchizedek has been studying human consciousness through sacred geometry and spiritual teachers and masters all over the world. 
1996, he was contacted by a source in Egypt who said that something incredible had been discovered. A stone stele came out of the ground between the paws of the Sphinx into the daylight. And this is recorded where? They removed it and dug into the earth beneath the Sphinx. There they found a room with three tunnels leading off of it. One of the tunnels, which went to the Great Pyramid, had another tunnel coming off it, and it was shielded by a wall of light. Cool story, bro. The Egyptian government found a particular person who could turn off this field. They also had brought in Paramount Studios to film it, as they had filmed the opening of King Tut's tomb. If any of this were true, it would have been front page news everywhere. It would have attracted scientists and reporters from all over the world, but I guess they really went there and they're just part of the cover-up, right? The government wanted several million dollars from Paramount, but at the last minute they asked for an extra one and a half million under the table. Paramount was outraged and they backed off. And that's supposed to explain why everyone else backed off too? And what's one and a half million dollars to Paramount? Things were silent for about three months. Then, Drunvalo heard from a source again, who was involved in all this, who said that three men shut off the light field and went inside. Again, where's this recorded? They found themselves inside a very large building that went on for miles underground, which was really the edge of a giant underground city, which was really just one giant building. Words cannot describe how stupid this is. If there were a giant city there, there would be archaeologists excavating it. There would be museums full of artifacts from it. And oh, there would be a giant city there! Everything in ancient Egypt was synthetic. They had this entire civilization based around achieving heightened states of consciousness, but they had to do it through tools. Now, we're not going to look at each of these tools individually, but let me give you a brief overview here. This tool was used for transferring vibrations into the body. So, it's a hammer. Looks more like a hook to me. This thing, however, was their most important tool, the Ankh. The Ankh isn't a tool, it's a symbol representing life. And they used it not as a physical tool, but as an energetic one. What the hell does that mean? They would use this form and Ankh their sexual energy. What? Wait, wait, H how do they... What, what do... Do I even want to know what that means? But what the Egyptians knew was that when you had an orgasm, a very large amount of energy bursts from your root chakra all the way up your spine to the top of your head, and then it gets released. What the Egyptians would do was when the spiral of energy hit their heart chakra, they would onk the energy out of the back of their body and over their head and back into their body, where they would keep the energy and retain a massive energy boost. Jordan, I know you think you're explaining it, but you're really not. And yes, that was a Big Bang Theory reference. In other words, if you take a tuning fork and hit it... Hit a tuning fork? How, how would you hit a tuning... Oh, you mean literally. Uh, sorry, the context threw me off. Then, if you attach an onk on top of it and hit it again... Are we still being literal? The first Atlantean to reach the immortal state was a man named Osiris. Ancient Egypt's mythology tells a story about Osiris. Right, and this has absolutely nothing to do with Atlantis. It's yet another case of New Age pseudo-historians hijacking an old myth. After the fall, we still had a photographic memory and could share these experiences with each other, which is called dream time. It is what the Aborigines of Australia still have today. So Jews are from space, Native Americans are aquatic, and Aborigines are telepathic. Through the introduction of writing, however, we began to change from the first level of consciousness into the second. We lost our incredible memories and became very separate from each other and ourselves. Completely false. With writing, we got a tool that allowed us to communicate without messenger and receiver being present together. It allowed them to be separated both in space and time. Writing is something that made civilization beyond the tribal level possible. It doesn't separate us, it brings us together in a way that no one would have thought possible before its discovery. But I can't say I'm surprised you say the exact opposite. You think philosophy makes people stupid. Thoth was the one who introduced writing. And if you look at ancient Egyptian culture, it even says Thoth brought writing to us, as well as many other things. Yes, according to Egyptian mythology, he did. He was, after all, the Egyptian god of knowledge and writing and magic, too, I think. But the only connection between Thoth and Atlantis is the bullshit that you've swallowed hook, line, and sinker and pass on in your stupid cartoons. Akhenaten was the first pharaoh, which meant that which you will become. He was also, believe it or not, 
15 to 16 feet tall. That's not a photograph, you idiot. Look, it's stylized art. And one thing that's common in stylized art, and I'm not saying it's all the time, but a lot of times in stylized art, more important individuals are depicted as larger because it draws attention to them. Akhenaten abolished all previous understandings of God and tried to instill a one God understanding in everyone. The majority of Egyptians revolted and Akhenaten was killed, soon to be replaced by someone else, returning to the old system. What actually happened? The priests lost power when Akhenaten outlawed worship of their gods and I think the rest is self-explanatory. But you don't mean what really happened, you mean what Melchizedek says happened, right? To correct the problem, Thoth got the help from I and Tia, who were the first immortals from Lemuria, and got them to mate interdimensionally to conceive a Christ consciousness being. Oh, so they onked. And she got knocked up, despite there being no merging of sperm and egg, which means it's impossible because an egg only contains half the genetic material required. And Egyptologists find that Akhenaten came completely out of nowhere. That doesn't indicate immaculate conception. It just means we don't know who his parents were. But, oh, wait, we do. Akhenaten was the son of Amenhotep III. There was a transitional period involving Amenhotep III, but soon Akhenaten was on the throne. So he inherited the throne from his father, and that's... strange? What? Akhenaten used his time to bring Egypt back to a simple religion where there was one god. Back? No. The Egyptians had always been polytheists. In fact, Atenism is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, form of monotheism. If you can even call it monotheism, because technically Akhenaten didn't declare the other gods non-existent. He just said you can't worship them. After all that, what did Akhenaten do that evidently saved humankind? Well, he developed a mystery school, with the intention of showing a small group of humans a way to ascend into the immortal state. Usually, it took hundreds of years to reach the level of immortality, and Akhenaten had 17 years to produce results. This was a very close call, but he did it. Aw, oh, you were talking about Amenhotep III and Akhenaten, and Akhenaten's attempt to introduce monotheism to Egypt. You were pretty close to reality there for a while, but now you've gone back to complete nonsense. Thoth wrote in the Emerald Tablets that after ancient Egypt ended, he brought a man named Pythagoras into the Great Pyramid and taught him the geometry of the universe. Ah, so now you're gonna insult the Greeks for a while, huh? That man then went on to found Greece, which was originally built upon schools for teaching geometry and the platonic solids and all of that stuff. No, Pythagoras didn't found Greece. Greece as a nation didn't exist until much later. What we call ancient Greece was actually a collection of independent city-states. Akhenaten's immortals became a group called the Essene Brotherhood. They first migrated to a place called Masada in Israel. Even today, Masada is known as the capital of the Essene Brotherhood. Now get this. In this brotherhood, there were two people in particular. A man and a woman. You might have heard of them. Mary and Joseph? No, the Essenes were a Jewish sect. They were Hebrew, not Egyptian. See, it was part of the Ascended Master's plan that they would bring in a being who would show the pathway to Christ Consciousness. He would come to Earth as a second level being, a regular Joe, and achieve Christ Consciousness through the course of his life. So now you're hijacking Christianity? Don't you think that's a little risky? I mean, even the dumbest Christian probably knows that Jesus was A. Not of Egyptian heritage, but Jewish. A son of David. And in that story, Jews were not aliens. B. Not the offspring of immortal humans, but of Yahweh, who apparently doesn't exist in Jordan's little story, and a perfectly ordinary mortal human. Not immortal Egyptian human. Mortal Hebrew human. And again, human. Hebrew human. Not alien. If you're going to hijack stories... I suggest you stick to stories that people are only vaguely familiar with, like Atlantis. I mean, most people have heard about it, but that's pretty much it. Hijacking one of the most famous stories ever told, uh, probably a bad idea. Then, the ascension process, the transitional experience from the second to third level, would go into the consciousness grid that was still being formed. 
He was able to transition because he was originally from these higher levels. What the onk does that mean? Now, as we all know, the story of Jesus has a missing piece. He was a child, disappeared for some time, and then showed up again when he was 30. In a book called The 18 Absent Years of Jesus Christ, the leading theories about where he went was actually out east to either the Himalayan or Tibetan mountains, where he became an enlightened guru. Speculation at best. There's no evidence to support any of this. In fact, there's no good evidence that Jesus even existed, although I don't find the claim that there was a guy named Jesus or Yeshua who preached to people in Israel during the Roman occupation and ended up being executed by means of crucifixion to be at all extraordinary. I'm happy to accept that he existed, but if we're going to get into specifics like where he was during these missing years, speculation isn't going to cut it. We know nothing about his real life, assuming he existed. And the story in the Bible tells us nothing about these missing years. So again, speculation at best, fan fiction at worst. Around 300 AD, there was a council called the Council of Nicaea, which was the syndication between the Roman political and religious authorities. Basically, the religious leaders and political leaders realized that they could unite and impose more influence on the people and control society through their unity. So you mean uh, take over the world? Of course! The term Christ actually stems back from much before the Bible. It comes from the word Christola. No, it's the anglicized form of the Greek Christos, pardon the pronunciation, which means anointed one, just like the anglicized Hebrew Messiah. Which is a word that derives from the original seven core audible sounds of creation. Gee, I could have sworn you said the sound of creation was Om. When Atlantis sank, the Maya took their knowledge, a crystal skull with memories of Atlantis. Seriously? Jordan, is there such a thing as a hoax that you don't buy? Over the last few hundred years, a group of people have slowly monopolized the entire world. Of course! Today, there are 13 families that are among the richest families in the world. They have their hands in next to every organization and government and control over 95% of the money. They control our modern world. Of course! Today, we like to call them the Illuminati. More and more information has become present lately that many of these families may have DNA that is different than the rest of the human population. They're aliens, right? It is speculated that they share DNA that was passed down from the Martian race. No, because there are no Martians! This story, while seemingly unbelievable and at times outrageous, does explain a lot. Yes, it is unbelievable. Yes, it is outrageous. No, it explains absolutely nothing. Jordan's video is without a doubt the single most stupid video I have seen on YouTube or anywhere else for that matter. Although I'm told he has one that's even worse. And it looks like I'm gonna have to watch that next time. See you then.